Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Stern, and I'm the director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art in New York. We research, discuss, publish, and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. Today, we continue last year's interdisciplinary exploration of trauma, memory, and its artistic expression from one generation to the next. I'm excited to welcome you to Memory, Empathy, and Image, the art of Louise Schulder from Germany and Kitra Kahana from Canada. After the discussion, we'll have time for questions, so please submit them in the Q&A function. This event is generously sponsored by the Consulate General of the Federal Republic of Germany in New York. It is my pleasure to now introduce our award-winning artists, Kitra Kahana and Luise Schröder. Kitra Kahana is a freelance documentary photographer, videographer, a photo video artist, and a TED speaker. She's a contributing photographer to National Geographic magazine. She has a BA in philosophy from McGill University and an MA in visual and media anthropology from the Freie University, uh, Universität in Berlin. Her work ranges from photographic studies of American teens for National Geographic magazine to documentaries on the annual life-saving dance competition in a small town in Northern Canada. She's renowned for work that consistently reflects a deep sense of empathy with her subjects. Kitra is the recipient of numerous grants and awards, including two Canada Council grants for the visual arts, a 2016 TED Senior Fellowship, the 2015 Pulitzer Center for Investigative Reporting Grant, the 2014-15 Artist Residency at Prim Center, the 2013 International Center of Photography's Infinity Award, first prize for the 2010 World Press Photo, a scholarship at Fabrica in, Itali in Italy and the Thomas Morgan internship at the New York Times. Luise Schröder is a visual artist working in France and Germany. She studied photography and media arts at the Academy of Visual Arts in Leipzig, Germany. Within her artistic practice, she's dealing with aspects of history in the making from today's perspective. She's interested in how cultures of remembrance and commemoration are influenced and formed by political agendas, media and image production, and how this affects identities and communities. In recent years, Luise Schröder has taken part in numerous single and group exhibitions, among others at the Recontre International Paris and Berlin, at the Kunsthalle Baden-Baden in Germany, at the Galerie Eigen and Art in Berlin and Leipzig, and at the 7th Berlin Biennale for Contemporary Art in Berlin. Alongside numerous other distinctions, the artist received the CEO Talents Prize in 2012 and the Spall Art Prize Salzburg in 2020. Furthermore, she was holding a residency at the Villa Aurora in Los Angeles in 2016 and was awarded a residency at Cité Internationale des Arts in 2018-19 in Paris by the German Federal Government Commissioner for Culture and the Media. Recently, she's working on her project La Barricade, Existing as a Promise, which is supported by the French Ministry of Culture, CNAP, and Atelier Medici. Medici. Welcome, Kitra and Louise. Uh, today's discussion is moderated by Ori Schultes, teaching professor at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, across the disciplines of theology, art history, philosophy, and politics. He's the former director and curator of the Bnebrit Klutznik National Jewish Museum, where he curated some 80 exhibitions. He's the author of several hundred articles and catalog essays, and the author or editor of 25 books, including The Ashen Rainbow, The Holocaust and the Arts, um, and Symbols of Faith, How Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Art Draw from the Same Source, and Tradition and Transformation, Three Millennia of Jewish Art and Architecture and Immortality, as well as Memory, Creativity, and Survival, The Arts of Alice Luke Kahana, Ronnie Kahana, and Kitra Kahana from 2020. I'll hand over now to Ori, who introduces us to the third generation after the Holocaust and the role of art. Welcome, Ori. 
Thank you so much, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here with all three of you and with the, all that audience out there who can see us, but we can't see them. That's always a bit intimidating, but we'll do our best. We are talking about um, the present, which is to say three generations after the Holocaust. And um, if the generation that went through it obviously had its own endless range of stories to tell, those stories impinged in different ways on the next generation. And suddenly we look up and we realize, but now it's the next generation. And we have with us two young individuals who were part of that next, next generation, the third generation. And uh, it raises for them and for us questions specifically about how the Holocaust might've affected what they became and what they became as artists and more broadly, because the Holocaust is, as it were, not only about the Holocaust, it is about the implications of the Holocaust, theological, historical, philosophical, in this case, art historical. And no two individuals of whom I'm aware are more appropriate to address this with us than Kitra and Luisa. Kitra, whose grandmother, as you will hear, Alice, was herself an artist who was herself a Holocaust survivor. So I'm fond of saying of Alice that she defeated Hitler three ways. She survived what she wasn't supposed to. She created a family and then a family that extended so far to three generations, defeating him that way. And most of all, she herself created art, which was a mode and a means of turning destruction into a unique kind of creativity. One of the aspects uh, for which Kitra as an artist is renowned, and Rachel mentioned this, is an, a level of empathy that turns her photography and her filmmaking in directions that someone will, how shall I put it, with less empathetic qualities might not achieve. And so her work has carried well beyond the Holocaust in the direction of contemporary issues like schizophrenia on the streets and how the police have to deal with it, who aren't trained to deal with it, to what's happening today in New Orleans in the aftermath of the latest flood. Her geography carries from Hudson Bay to Texas and everywhere. Louisa, who has mentioned specifically in her resume how she is interested in how cultures of remembrance and commemoration are influenced and formed by political agendas, so I'm quoting her directly, comes from not only Germany but from Eastern Germany, a world in the aftermath of the Holocaust which did not recognize that the Holocaust had taken place. So she is someone who grew up, as it were, at the site, the epicenter of Holocaust activity, unaware of it, or at least not taught about it, not having it spoken about by her elders, and obviously reached a point where she became very much aware of it, and more than that, of its implications. So that Louisa's work not only can reflect, as it often does, on the Holocaust in very specific ways pertaining to memory and pertaining to how we feel about things that are uncomfortable for us. But also like Kitra, her work carries beyond the Holocaust into a range of different aspects of memory, commemoration, political agendas and the like. Both of these two individuals, as you heard from Rachel, who just gave you the tip of the iceberg, have phenomenal resumes have done extraordinary work, have won an, an inordinate number of awards. It's ridiculous between the two of them how many they have won. Both of them reflect and resonate from past events to present thinking and raise constant and consistent future questions. Where are we as a species going? In photography, in video, in filmmaking, in installation work and so on. They deal with art which has been across a range of different ways, an instrument for addressing the ineffable, that which we cannot describe with words because it transcends words. The word ineffable is typically used when one speaks in the Abraham tradition of God, that God's very name, for example, in Hebrew cannot be properly pronounced. And so moving from words, what we call religion has across human history and geography, used art as an instrument for trying to address that, visual images, music, dance, and the like. But an event like the Holocaust has its own level of negative ineffability, and whatever it does or doesn't say about divinity, 
it clearly and distinctly shows a very dark underside of humanity and what we are about. So visual artists during the Holocaust were record keepers of events which defy words that were nonetheless taking place. And visual arts after the Holocaust, like their associates in other art forms, have reflected on what those events were and what the implications of those events are. So survivors like Alice Locke Kahana, a growing array of visual artists, particularly from the 1970s on, in other words, it took time for such individuals to be able to really turn back to that kind of a topic. Family members like Alice's son and Kitra's father, Rani Kahana, whose medium, however, was not visual, but verbal, his poetry, like Kitra herself, whose visual instruments are different from Alice's and yet reflect an ongoing connection to what you might say she learned at her grandmother's knee. And non-family members, and one finds if one looks across the visual arts and the subject of the Holocaust, that there are two groups, not surprisingly, that are most likely to turn to it at some point in the course of what they do. One, not surprisingly, is the Jews, the other is the Germans and the Austrians, because that was the place where the events were spawned that um, are so beyond our ability to describe in words. The reflection on these events carries well beyond the boundaries of the Holocaust itself then, and into the larger questions of human experience, of our relationship with each other, in some cases, our relationship with divinity. And I would like to turn now to each of our two panelists, our two artists, to speak first of all, and I'm going to address Kitra first, to address this question to Kitra first, what really brought you to your work in terms of the subject and in terms of the media that you use? Kitra, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, so um, my, my grandmother, Alice Lokahana, is really, um, I would say, at the very kernel of all of my being as a person, an artist, a documenter. And it's her story of the Holocaust that um, moves me to be a documenter. I was to, to documentation. I was, um, sh she was the type of Holocaust survivor who uh, told her story and to told it endlessly from the time we were very, very young. Some, some survivors didn't speak and others almost spoke too much. Um, and so I was inundated with her story, with the, you know, we went back and visited the sites of the Holocaust and, um, and her art, which uh, permeated my internal landscape. So just, you, you know, or you spoke about that knee um, that I was exposed to her story and her art sitting at her knee. And I just wanted to start by sharing this uh, footage of her encouraging me to be an artist from a very, very young age. And this is in her studio in Houston, Texas. And so I was surrounded by her art. This is her art. Um, and in her, her work, she was working with photography as well, a lot of mixed media. And that had a very profound influence on me. Like she would, every time we would go visit her, um, she would ask us to look at the artwork and to, to tell us to, to say what we saw within the work itself. So this really um, opened me up to this idea of telling the importance of telling historicals, uh, of documenting the events around us through art. Um, and I became a photojournalist, a documentary photographer when I was 16 um, and have been working in, you know, around the world um, 
as a documentary photographer and filmmaker ever since. Right now I'm in New Orleans in Louisiana. And this past week I've been um, documenting the, the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. So I thought I would just start by sharing some of the work that I've been doing here. Um, and this is both in um, the like the New Orleans area and down the bayous as well in the different parishes. We are back to the God versus human question, aren't we? Right there, yeah. front and center. <laughs> And the devastation has been just complete in many of these areas. Um, the news story really focused on how New Orleans was spared throughout this time, but there's many communities that have just been left completely devastated. Um, and that's why I feel it's really important to be here and to document what's happening. Okay. So. Great. Louisa, mm -hmm. what brought you to your work in terms of subject, in terms of media? The floor is now yours. Um, as an artist, I mean, I grew up in East Germany, as you told to the public already. So I was born in a small town close to Berlin. It's called Potsdam, but it's from the historical point of view, it's a quite important uh, place because the division of Germany took place here. So um, I grew up in East Germany. And when I was about six or seven years old, I think it was seven, uh, the wall broke down. So um, immediately a lot of big changes happened to my family. My father, he left uh, already East Germany before the um, breaking of the wall. So a lot of things were in a very big, let's say, shaking situation. So everything was shaking. The whole society was breaking kind of apart. Then uh, the reunification of Germany took place. And for me, this was a period, I mean, I was a teenager, but I started to ask myself, where do I come from? This country is not existing anymore. And um, there, is, uh, there was the, the, the question for me that I have to search for identity and also in the school. I mean, I grew up, let's say, in socialism and the education in school was very much related to maybe not as in, in that manner uh, directed to, to the idea and the history of communism as it was in the 50s or in the 60s, but at least this was a very strong topic. And it's, it's, it took, I mean, it's part of an education that lasts even though this country collapses. And so I was really interested in finding out more about my identity and um, how I could deal with that and what is history and I asked myself a lot of questions and there was also the question of the world war ii and um, the holocaust it it wasn't really as you described it was a topic but it was it was not such a big topic in school as uh, it should have been so I started really to to ask myself okay you are born in a kind of situation that you were always told you are an anti-fascistic person, you are a young person that's growing up with a very anti-fascistic uh, like attitude, but I never really questions my, questioned myself since uh, in, when I was young. So uh, I, when I was becoming a teenager, I was kind of more asking, asking more questions. I asked my grandmother what was happening uh, during World War II. Um, did you ever saw that the Jews were persecuted in your in your village? And I asked a lot of questions. And so I started really to go also to the former concentration camps and to be interested in the history. And I see myself then starting to 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 look for a way of of uh, understanding or also for expressing myself. So then photography came into this possibility because I was looking at photo books. I was um, asking, I also went to a small organization that is called Offener Kunstverein. They started with us painting and they were dealing a lot with art. So, 
asking questions was always a very, very big um, motivation for me to deal with history. And um, then I visited these places and I was trying to find out what is my position and what is my responsibility also as a German uh, to these events, to the Holocaust, to the Second World War. And um, I found out that art for me is a possibility to, to record, to document, to ask questions, to search for images, to look also for things that are not visualized. So um, I started then also to, um, as I grew up in, in, in Potsdam in a so-called squatters movement, it developed um, after the big changes in, it came, it was happening in the past. So people were squatting houses against the policy, uh, against the policy of the, of the living conditions and so on, like in old, like old houses to live there and to develop a different way of living. So this then came over to Potsdam and it was a very political scene. So I tried to focus on the idea of how can I bring my political engagement together with doing art and how can I connect this, my historical interest and also my historical responsibility as a German to, to bring it together with doing art. And so I, it started from photography. I studied photography then and step by step um, through various topics, there was a moment when I really wanted to connect it. And um, the first video work I did was on the, as you already introduced me, like I'm dealing a lot with commemoration and with memory and with history in the making. So I went to Auschwitz-Birkenau to make a film um, about the, it was, I shot it on the 27th of January, which is a commemoration day, the International Commemoration Day for the Holocaust. And this really changed my, I mean, this personal experience really changed my way of dealing with art, of seeing art, of making art. So I really started from that point on to focus more on a political way of dealing with art and using images for images for that. Oh. Muted, thank you. Uh, that's because my dog was barking and I wanted him not to be heard. <laughs> uh, I have two questions for both of you, very different ones. Um, and you can duke it out to who answers first. One, and both of you have addressed this a little bit. Um, there are a lot of different media in art. You know, there's painting, there's sculpture, there's a painting behind Kitra, there's a, a public sculpture behind Luisa. Um, there's a Fritz Asher painting behind uh, Rachel Stern. But you chose photography and other media, but, and, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about the range of what, when I'm using the word photography, I suspect most of us just associate that with stills. Mm -hmm. And neither of you has limited yourself to that. So that's one question I'd be, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about from each of you, whoever wants to go first. Um, sure, I, um, I, was, I was mesmerized as a child by the images that I saw of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, both when we, we traveled as a family around Europe when I must have been like eight or nine years old and we visited many different concentration camps the images that uh, my grandmother sourced and would embed within her paintings. Um, and I always, I always felt so deeply grateful to the, to whoever those photographers were, even if, the, you know, be, if they were Nazi soldiers, British, Russian, whoever those people were who documented and, um, created proof of what had taken place, especially in this world where truth can be questioned so easily. Um, and so I, I really feel like the imagery, like my visual sensibilities that were embedded with me and within me as a child, my aesthetic sensibilities came from my grandmother, but the visuals were very much of genocide and Holocaust. Um, and it's something that's been, um, you know, that I think guides the way that I see the world and literally see, you know, see images 
um, is informed by those early um, Holocaust uh, visuals of bodies and of the camps and even just the aesthetic, the colors themselves, the dirt. Um, there's the, you know, the barren trees, like there's a, there's a feeling, a gesture that I sensed very early on and was quite moved by. And um, so photography, you know, so on, on one hand, there's that just the visual influence of those images, but also the power of of documentation itself and the importance of it to be to be someone who says this happened. This was, you know, I'm not, there's certainly subjectivity to photography, but it brings us closer to truth, hopefully. Um, then if the image, then if the documentation never existed. So much of history is forgotten without documentation. So I'm a, I'm a really strong believer in the importance of having humans on the ground who are interpreting the world, interpreting the horror through a poetic maybe sensibility. And the, in that poetry, that visual poetry, there is some kind of lifted humanity that, you know, the, that we can see through it and that, you know, that we speak to future generations through our photography. So even being here in New Orleans now, in Louisiana, there's, you know, I, there's my own work that I'm creating, but I also feel like um, being a doc, being someone who documents is being a part of it's putting your place within history. And there's, it's not, you know, I'll never know the full extent that any one of my images can ever make. Um, sometimes you take a document that means one thing in one context and then it becomes a very personal thing to someone else in a different context. Um, taken many images of people who've passed on that take on new meaning with time. Um, so yeah, thank you. Louisa? Mm -hmm. you I would like to Sure. Yeah, I would like to share um, some images with you. Okay. So dealing with photography is, uh, I will I will refer to what Kitra said uh, at the end of this because the, this is part of my experience too. I was uh, dealing a lot with images from the Holocaust to, to discover, to also see something that is not documented and to analyze what is not documented. But first of all, this is the way, this is my first photograph actually. And um, this is my grandparents. And I took this picture when I was uh, six years old. I had, um, there was just one camera that they had in the GDR and it was a small Bayrette, it's a small pink camera and it's, nothing big but it was my first camera and I remember my mother telling me that I always told her that I have a little camera in my head so I'm documenting all the situations around me and then suddenly this is more an image uh, as a reference but then the big changes came and I as I told before I started really to to discover photography as a medium as dealing also with photography with east german photography which is a lot which had a lot of big influence to my um, photographic approach so this is even a picture that is taken in my hometown and uh, i mean looking at these images that have been taken in the 80s which was not the time when i when i saw them but this really gave me a vision to deal with photography and to the question of loss is a very important one to me as well, starting taking pictures of something that one day maybe is not existing anymore. So really this, this method of, okay, if I record something, I can keep it, it's an image, it's there. And um, so dealing with identity and photography, I was living in Bulgaria um, after I finished school. So as I told before, like the idea of question or the question of searching for my identity, I did a lot of 
I did a big project in uh, Bulgaria and Sofia, which is called Hope, Freedom, Friendship and Youth. It's one of my, actually it's my first real photographic work that I did as a, as a body of work. And I was trying to, with the help of my Bulgarian friends, trying to look, look what is left from the world we come from or we came from, which is no longer existing, the states or, or this kind of political system, which is no longer existing. And um, then I turned more as um, also Kitra, like I started to extend the idea of photography. So I wanted to, I tried out with video, I tried out if always with the photographic approach. So dealing with photography means for me still taking pictures, but not only also like dealing with it in moving images or like using the photographic view as a starting point also for dealing with moving images. And this is the, the film I told uh, in the beginning uh, that I shoot in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And it's a, it's a question, it's a situation of, um, of waiting. It's a situation of waiting, it's snowing. And the, the commemoration ceremony should take place, but there's some, that something happened that it couldn't take place. So I was, shooting this moment of waiting and for me it was a after when i made the editing of the film i was thinking it's this this moment of not speaking of being silent together standing and reflecting is something that i would like to that my art can kind of uh, provide this for 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 viewers or for like to make the open up this kind of room or place or space for reflection That's great. and af after that i came more to i started to be i'm still a photographer but in a different sense i would describe myself more as a picture editor or an editor of phot photography that would say that i'm working with photography but in very very different forms so after that i started for, for the first time to deal with archives and images and this is the work that I did in Israel. It's about the uh, kibbutz, um, the history of the kibbutz and the way women were photographed in kibbutz. I will tell it a bit later um, about this work. So this is what brought me from media to media. And today I would describe the choice of media is very different. Uh, it's very various, but photography is still always the starting point. Like I put a lot of research in my work. There's a lot of research. I'm looking for press articles. I'm looking for press images. I'm looking for images that have something inside of them that makes me think that is not, that is strange. And this could be a starting point for a new work, like to search for other archives or like, yeah. It's really always starting from this photographic image, but then going further in different and various media. Yeah, this for now. Fantastic. Here's my second question, um, because uh, both of you in various ways and in varying degrees um, are want to embed um, a political discussion in at least some of your work. And politics, has never been in the history of humanity disconnected from religion. And art, as I said earlier, has served over the course of human history as an instrument for religion to do what it does in addressing this ineffable realm where words won't work. So I'm just curious, um, and I suspect the answers will be very different from the two of you, but I'm just curious uh, what role, if any, religion or thinking about religion has played in how all of this has developed? And the answer could be, I don't know, the answer would be nothing. The answer could be, it's a profound influence on whatever. I'm just curious. Sorry for that curveball, but it just struck me. It's too interesting to avoid or evade. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was, my father's a rabbi. Um, I was raised religious and have become um, slightly less religious, let's say, but not spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that came to my mind is it's not 
it's not really like an intellectual answer, but once one has that, once you've had that, ex, like, I don't, I don't, my feeling is that religion isn't so much in the realm of belief, which it's often sort of portrayed as, but much more as like an experience of the world. Like being a spiritual religious person is a certain way of um, experiencing the world and feeling one with, you know, creation, being mm -hmm. a part of creation, um, which is beyond the intellect. I feel, um, mm -hmm. and so when I think about where my aesthetic kind of visual sense comes from and kind of the ineffable quality of art making and of like the way that an image or a piece of art can come together, but it's not pushed, at least for me, it's not pushed from the intellect. It's something that I feel I experience and then kind of respond to and create through in relationship with that experience. Find I find art creation to be quite spiritual in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. and, and something that um, growing up within like a, you know, the, the water around me being one of spirituality and that language of spirituality is very, um, very connected to my art making. It's a similar feeling, that feeling of tapping into a God sense or a being one with creation. Um, that's a moment of art making. It, it feels the same. So and Louisa, I don't wanna presume, but mm -hmm. from what I understand culturally, politically, historically, of the world in which you grew up, religion was <laughs> hardly a presence. Uh, did it ever cross your radar screen at any point as you were developing as an artist? Or yes. An interest at least, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I wasn't baptized when I was uh, growing up. So I grew up without religion. So religion hadn't, didn't really play a big role uh, during my childhood. But uh, when I was in Bulgaria, for example, um, it, um, it took a much bigger role. So I was, I mean, art creation and having access to art, also like looking at paintings in churches, looking at uh, paintings, um, from various religious backgrounds. This also gave me a, a way of seeing things in a very poetic way. So this kind of spirituality mm -hmm. is more connected to poetically, to a yes. po poetic, so to a poetic. So when I was uh, living in Bulgaria, um, it's an Orthodox country. So I was visiting the, the churches quite a lot. And there's a, there is a music, that I connect with that, which is so strong and which is something that, I mean, it's not part of my art creation, that sense, but I can, when I listen to that music, it's mm -hmm. something that, yeah, this kind of feeling of, wow, this is yes something incredible. And also like, uh, I mean, I'm speaking now from a Christian background, but like uh, icons and, um, paintings in churches for me it was always like these stories and uh, seeing things like yeah like it, it's what it was really it's having an influence especially looking at art creation in the world not only from this christian point of view but like in a we i also in this kind of small organization that i told you about in the beginning where i started to paint and play theater this was always having a big, big role, like dealing with art from everywhere and always like uh, from looking at art from Judaism as well, looking at art created um, in the Arab world. So it broadened really my sense of what creation and what art creation could be. Wonderful. Can we transition now back to uh, both of your works? And as long as... Um, we're on to Luisa. Why don't we turn to you first to talk a little bit more about your work and then back to Kitra. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would like to introduce three works um, to you. 
um, therefore I would open a, a PDF, which disappeared a little. I would take, no, it's here. Um, so I will share the screen. So this was the last image I showed to you. So this is a work that I did in uh, 2014 and now going back to the topic of the Holocaust. For me, um, as a German especially, and as a member or not a member, but speaking from the third generation's point of view, for me, it was always interesting and super necessary. And I really feel a responsibility about it to deal with the topic of the Holocaust in today's society, especially in German society, not only, but in general, this is where I'm working um, a lot. Uh, right-wing extremism and um, especially the rising of uh, right-wing parties and uh, opinions um, during the last years after reunification um, became bigger and it became, I mean, it really, the, the development was really, it's, it's strong. So uh, I see my responsibility also as an artist to deal with the mediation of history and like dealing with the Holocaust today, um, pointing at things which are invisible, for example, is, is for me a very important uh, starting point, point for my work. And this is a work that I did in uh, close by to Leipzig, Flossberg and Boycha. These are two villages close next to each other. And in between 44 and 45, um, there was a concentration camp. I mean, there was, were a lot of kind of these outside camps from uh, Buchenwald, but in every, I mean, and this is even, I mean, it's unbelievable, but in every village, people of forced laborers uh, had to work. Um, Jewish people were put in these uh, concentration camps, for example, in this one to build uh, bazookas. They brought them back from Polish concentration camps back to Germany because the front was coming closer to Germany again. So they were um, kind of transferring the production. And I visited this place. It's a project that was initiated by, a, by an organization called Kulturbahnhof. I visited this place and there was nothing except one small um, hint, which was a written a monument. It was very deep in the in the forest, but there was no commemoration sign. There was no monument to to remember, and so I decided <coughs> that I would like to ask the people and to involve the people of the of the village to work with me and to make pictures of them, pointing at this very far place in the woods. Nobody. I mean, it was always this thing. Something happens there, but we don't really know. I mean, it's like, or we didn't really know what happened there. And in order to make this kind of situation of the concentration camp and the history of the concentration camp and the history of the victims that have been killed there and that died there because of hunger and of the living conditions, I wanted to create monuments and public space that um, kind of point at these places, at this place uh, in the forest. So I try to make people aware in the in the village to work with me, and they really decided to work with me. And I could make the pictures of them and um, these kind of monuments were in the two villages, like for two months. And the interesting thing was it was really like a participatory project in the sense of the people from the village were asked by other people from other villages, what's going on in your place? And automatically they had to tell the history of their village and the history of what I am referring to because you they could even identify the people on the images. So it's something that has to do with them. And this is something also which, which is important for my art. The question always to ask what it has to do with me and it, what, what it has to do with people that I'm working with. So to create a connection between the past and the present. And uh, this is another work. I uh, referred to this work um, before um, when explaining that I work also with archives. 
It's a work from 2015. It's a work called She Takes a Hand Herself in History. And uh, I went to Israel for the first time when I was 15. And um, I visited a, a kibbutz. And for me, this was a, an amazing uh, experience in the sense of that there was this socialist utopia idea that the, the, the kibbutzim were created. I mean, there's also this myth of the kibbutz, but like in the sense of this place could have so something to do with also the country I come from, which is not longer existing, made me really interested in this topic, the topic of the kibbutz. And then I, made, uh, then I met a very interesting person, Guy Ras from, from Israel. And he explained to me that there had been women photographers. And as I'm a photographer and also dealing with photography, I was really interested in the idea of um, how women were photographed in the kibbutz, because especially between 1920 and 1970, there was always a kibbutz photographer who was, who was recording the whole history or the like the daily events of the kibbutz. But um, also always under this ideology uh, point of view in creating this story of the kibbutz as a, as a, as a story which functions uh, within the political situation uh, of Israel. And I was really interested, is there, if there was a woman photographer among the kibbutz photographers, did they had another vision of visualizing the women in the kibbutz. So I was trying to go to different archives and I found five different women photographers during this period who took pictures also of women. And I made this archive collage and it's a wallpaper as you can see. And then I was really interested in the connection to the present. So I was um, looking for young women today living in the kibbutz and what is their vision of the kibbutz and their um, their idea of the role of women in the kibbutz. And so I tried to find out, I asked them to reenact the old pictures with me. And then in an interview to describe why they choose this picture, how do they see themselves in this reenactment of this old phot photography? And what do they think is the difference between their grandmother, their mother and uh, themselves? Like, living in the kibbutz and what is the heritage of the kibbutz and so also like dealing with the gender questions uh, in terms of equality um, in the kibbutz was a very big um, issue in this work and um, this is another work that um, I was um, I will show a small trailer it's a work that I created in the United States and I also, I mean, I deal with commemoration, I deal with memory, I do, I deal with rituals and uh, forms of um, commemoration. So um, I was invited to come to Los Angeles to live in uh, the Leon Feuchtwanger Villa, the Villa Aurora. Leon Feuchtwanger, he was, uh, he went on, I mean, he was uh, persecuted in Germany as a Jew. So he went to the States in order to continue living and writing. And it's a it's a residency where um, artists from Germany are invited to to work on a certain project. And I came across the images of Ansel Adams and Dorothea Lang about the um, Japanese American internment during the Second World War. And this was the starting point then for work that I created um, 350 miles away from Los Angeles in Manzanar. It was one of the camps that uh, Japanese Americans were uh, brought to after the attack on Pearl Harbor and after President Roosevelt. Um, um, there was an, the, the order 9066, which was um, directed towards Japanese Americans, uh, US citizens, uh, and that uh, America was afraid, or the United States was afraid of spy spies because um, Japan Japan just declared the war. So about one hundred twenty thousand Japanese Americans were brought into camps, especially on the west coast. And once a year, they come to Manzanar. It's a historical site since the middle of the eighties. 
and uh, they commemorate this uh, internment and incarceration. So I, I was really interested in what what's going to happen and what is this way of commemoration and does it have something to do with me or can I deal with it? Who I am doing this kind of work, but. Um, as it is so much connected also again with photography and the, the question of recording and commemoration. Um, I did a 17 minutes uh, film that I want to show you now a small um, part of. It's three minutes. Okay, I will start it. I'd like to thank the 30-something Arab Muslim Mehta, daughter of a Syrian migrant to the U.S. in 1942, would not only stand in opposition to xenophobia towards Muslims and Arabs in 2016. I would like to thank when any other group I am not a part of endures collective punishment, I would swiftly stand by their side for their justice. I would like to think I would act in the full remembrance of history like the Los Angeles Japanese American community did in Little Tokyo after 9-11. They embraced us, Muslims and Arabs, stood by us, by our side, for our justice, and they said, never forget. Thank you, Luisa. So moving from the transcultural international across the ocean coverage of a range of, of issues and ideas that have all kinds of implications, we turn and turning last to, to Kitra again, both to the very personal, but also to a transcending of the boundaries of what some might consider to be the norms of photography. Kitra floor is yours and do yes unmute yourself you did yeah so i'd like to just uh quickly share a little bit from the work i've been doing with my father um he had a brainstem stroke 11 uh, 10 years ago and um we've been we've been collaborators since then um he had a very like spiritual experience throughout um his stroke whereas other people uh would see see this as maybe the greatest tragedy um he was someone who very much um had like a profound spiritual experience through his stroke and so um, in the last 10 years, I've been documenting his experience and also combining it with some of his texts. Um, he writes, 
Is this what you want, my blessed God, my slow at last body winding, pending upon itself, like an ungiving tr train circling into itself, um, like that unforgiven snake? There is peace in that slow, soft swallow of this heart in so many parts. Each combination has the same pulse, but they do not touch each other. It is my mind that forms the clay of protection, hands holding each other, torso pumping each leg. Dead and alive have no more clarity together. Forever becomes now. I'm whole even with these million fragments. And so um, last year during, you know, in March of 2020, um, my father lives in a nursing home and he, his nursing home went into complete lockdown and um, he didn't leave his room basically for the next 15 months. And it wasn't for a number of months before we were even allowed back in. Um, many people died in his nursing home of COVID. It was a quite traumatic time. And I wanted to continue documenting his experience. And so last year um, we had, uh, as is common with many families, um, we placed uh, Cameron in his room to monitor his care, to make sure that he doesn't fall out of bed at night um, and to be and to stay in communication with him. And I use these cameras to document his experience um, uh, in isolation, um, I worked on a film uh, for the National Film Board of Canada as part of this project, and I'm continuing to work on this. Um, he writes, or I, every day I interviewed him throughout this process. And so these are quotes from him. My room, my room extends, my room expands. I don't see the floor, the roof or the floors above me. I see open sky, the windows pushed out and no walls. I see my bed floating and bringing me to open shine. Even at night, I live in the upper reaches. This is the room of endless spirit. It's also documented what was, because I could control where these cameras looked. Um, I, I filmed what was taking place outside of his room. Um, one of the orderlies taking a break on the bench. Um, the caregiving. Uh, this is his communication setup, um, which allowed us to stay in touch with him um, and allows him to go on the computer. He says, now it's only God presence everywhere. There is a new recognition that no one's in charge. It's the earth's turn to revive and the skies are bluer outside my window. Here it's excellence again. Birds are returning. I see the beauty of resurrection. Life and nature rebounds. Life and nature rebounds. A nice note on which to conclude. Um, I wanna thank both of you for just giving us tiny slices of what are enormous and very, very rich pies. I haven't decided whether they're chocolate cream or banana or apple. Maybe it's a combination of all those media, very rich pies indeed. And uh, turn the, the mic back to Rachel. really have much time left. I have one question here and whoever wants to, you know, maybe we give, go a little bit over time because Sharon asked, um, uh, she's wondering if uh, Louise, your parents or grandparents have related their experiences of the wartime as Kitra's grandmother did or uh, whether there was a blanket of quiet, really. Uh, uh, I would, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I would relate that to my grandmother. She was, uh, she was born in 33. 
So she was a kid uh, during the Second World War, but she uh, told me a lot about it. And she was also telling about her Jewish neighbors that she was asking her mother why they um, crashed the windows um, on the 9th of November. So we talked about it, but more in a, in a sense of reflection. I mean, I was, I asked this question when I was 14 or 15, so, and she was really answering, but in general, I would say the question of dealing with the Holocaust, like also that I experienced in the village, it's not, it's very rare that someone wants to remember something and then, and uh, that someone wants to, to talk about it from this perspective of, uh, uh, from this generation that uh, was living during that time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm getting feedback here uh, how how moving the presentations of um, both of yours were, and actually uh, uh, just now also that this um, uh, is is really your presentations were very perfect for a reflective time because as Jews we're in this time between Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the new year and Yom Kippur. So it's it's a time of introspection and reflection. So thank you so much for sharing your work in this. I, I didn't even know how perfect this timing was. <laughs> and, and, and Rachel, uh, of course, 9-11 as well. So as Americans, Americans are rarely very reflective but in the last two days, we have been somewhat reflective. By the way, it's interesting that both of you, it was at the age of 14 that, that you turned a particular point. And uh, I know with, with Kitra, it's when she turned 14, she thought of where Alice was going at 14, which was toward Auschwitz. And you, Luisa, you were 14 with this first conversation with your grandmother. So very interesting, important age, I guess. Uh Yes, for sure. So thank you so much, Kitra and Louisa, for sharing your work with us and your thoughts and uh, your process. And um, good luck for your, you know, all the energy and insights for continuing your important work. And I uh, thank Ori for moderating the event and wish everybody uh, that you're staying healthy and be well. And um, stay in touch and yes by the way here's a question whether we are um uh, uh recording the event yes we did record the event and we'll make it available on youtube so i'll send out that link uh, after the event so thank you so much everyone be well and uh uh take care bye thank you oh.